The uh, subcommittee will come to order, and good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for being here. Today's hearing will address the persistent and too often underestimated threat to global public health posed by tuberculosis. This brutal, contagious disease killed 1.7 million people in 2016, the most recent data available, making it the deadliest infectious disease in the world, killing more than both HIV AIDS and malaria combined. TB is devastating for many people globally, but it impacts the people of Africa, especially Southern Africa, disproportionately. In 2016, 44% of all TB deaths occurred in the Africa region, in spite of accounting for only 25% of all new TB cases. Africans die at a rate of 72 per 100,000 infected, compared with 35 per 100,000 in Southeast Asia, and 13 per 100,000 in the Eastern Mediterranean region. Those infected with HIV AIDS are particularly vulnerable to TB, and nearly three quarters of those co-infected with HIV and, and TB in 2016 uh, lived in Sub-Saharan Africa. Thankfully, most cases of TB are curable if patients are diagnosed and adhere to a proper treatment regimen. However, millions of newly infected people go undiagnosed and without treatment each year, and the global spread of multiple drug resistant, or MDR, or extensively drug resistant XDR TB, which emerges when patients receive inappropriate or incomplete treatment, poses an even greater and more costly threat. In 2016, roughly 490,000 people develop MDR TB, an additional 110 new cases were resistant to the most effective treatment. Not only is treating MDR and XDR TB a grueling process for the patient, it also costs far more to treat than the other manifestation of the disease. One study by the Stop TB Partnership estimated that drug-resistant TB could kill up to 2.5 million people annually and cost the global economy 16.7 trillion if left unchecked. The dangerous potential of a drug-resistant TB outbreak is evident in the South African mining sector where exposure to silica dust Crowded, poor living conditions and high HIV prevalence created an incubator for disease and heightened the risk of contracting TB. Further complicating the problem, uh, approximately 40% of mine workers are migrants who frequently move across borders and don't receive consistent medical treatment from public health systems in the region that do not coordinate sufficiently. This further increases the risk of MDR and XDR TB infections. I am encouraged to see that U.S. funding for combating TB increased to $261 million in 2018, which is $20 million more than was allocated in 17, and more than $82 million higher than the administration's request. This shows that my colleagues and I and all of us are taking this threat seriously, and I think that is a positive step on our part. I, but we must not stop there or become complacent in any way. The World Health Organization anticipates a $7.4 billion budget shortfall for the global plan to NTB if the international community does not significantly increase funding. We must encourage our international partners to step up to this challenge and take the opportunity of the UN General Assembly high-level meeting on ending TB this September to do so. But even more, we must explore more innovative and holistic approaches to eliminating this disease. We must work from a regional perspective and increase coordination among health systems. We must pay special attention to the mines in South Africa. We must redouble our efforts to diagnose and treat every person infected with TB. And we must pull out all the stops when it comes to preventing MDR or XDR TB infections. We must also encourage the World Health Organization to stop being overly bureaucratic when it comes to battling TB. There are bottlenecks in the WHO approval process for new treatments and new diagnostic tests which are need to be fixed. I am looking forward to hearing from our very distinguished panel, which I'll introduce shortly. I would like to welcome uh, Tommy and Amanda Russo, uh, distinguished guests who are here visiting and their parents uh, from Howell Township in my district. Thank you, Tommy and Amanda, for being here. And I would like to yield to my good friend and colleague, the ranking member, uh, Ms. Bass. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank you for 
convening today's hearing on combating tuberculosis in Southern Africa. We know this is an issue that is important uh, to all of us with the global dimensions that impact everyone. I wanna thank our witnesses for taking the time to testify before this committee today. We know that you have dedicated your life to addressing the great public health challenges, and we thank you. I also wanna thank Ranking Member Ingle, uh, who might be here. He has uh, consistently championed several health priorities, and in particular, the spread of tuberculosis, both multi-drug resistant and extensively drug resistant TB. Um, in 2016, 25% of all new TB cases developed in Africa, and 2.5 million people, 44% of all TB deaths occurred in the region. Meanwhile, we know that TB cases are both preventable and curable. But we're here today because the Southern African region has the highest incidence of TB in the world. The association with HIV AIDS and co-infection has made TB one of the leading killers of HIV positive people globally. And Southern Africa has one of the highest burdens of TB and the highest burdens of HIV. Defeating TB requires expanding access to affordable treatment, but also prevention of TB in the first place. I look forward to hearing on how the U.S. is supporting more effective treatment as well as prevention. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ranking Member. I uh, now would like to introduce our distinguished panel, uh, beginning first with Dr. Rebecca Martin, who is the director of the Center for Global Health at the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC. With over 18 years of experience working with immunization, HIV, and health system strengthening, Dr. Martin is a leading expert in the field of international health. She has worked extensively in Africa to measure and evaluate the HIV AIDS epidemic and equip nations to respond effectively. As director of the Center for Global Health, Dr. Martin leads the CDC's global effort to protect and improve health globally through science, policy, partnership, and evidence-based health action. We are delighted that she is here today to provide her uh, expert insights. Ambassador Deborah Burks, medical doctor, is the coordinator for the United States government activities to combat HIV AIDS and U.S. Special Representative for Global Health Diplomacy. Over her 30-year career, she has focused on HIV immunology, vaccine research, and global health. Ambassador Burks oversees the implementation of the U.S. President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, or PEPFAR, and all U.S. government engagement with the Global Fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. In her role as U.S. Special Representative for Global Health Diplomacy, she works to align the U.S. government's diplomacy with foreign assistance program, programs and address global health challenges and move toward achieving goals, including eliminating AIDS, ending preventable child and maternal deaths, and combating infectious disease threats. Uh, we'll then hear from uh, Irene uh, Cook, who is the Senior Deputy Assistant Administrator in USAID's Global Health Bureau. Previously, she was the Senior Infectious Disease Advisor for the Global Health Bureau and the Global Health Security Agenda led uh, 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 at USAID. From 2010 to 14, she was Director of the Health Office in USAID Indonesia, where she also served as a Health Attaché and PEPFAR Coordinator. <laughs> During her 32-year career with USAID, uh, Ms. Cook has also worked as a health advisor to the Policy and Program Coordination uh, Bureau and as Chief of Infectious Disease Division in the Global Health Bureau, helped start the President's Malaria Initiative and served as chair of the STOP TB Coordinating Board. Ms. Cook, um, uh, thank you uh, for being here as well. And without objection, uh, your four, uh, full resumes will be made a part of the record. Uh, but Dr. Martin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chairman Smith and Ranking Member Bass. My name is Dr. Rebecca Martin, and I serve as the Director for the Center for Global Health within the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today to discuss the global health security threat of drug-resistant tuberculosis and CDC's critical role in preventing and stopping it. It is a pleasure to join my friends and colleagues, Ambassador Burks and Deputy Assistant Administrator Cook. In 1973, my older sister was exposed to DB and had an infected and had to undergo nine months of treatment, a practice still valid today in many countries nearly 50 years later. In 1991, I worked in Haiti to set up a cutting edge laboratory for TB with fluorescent microscopy, still in use nearly 30 years later in resource constrained countries. 
HIV drives the TB epidemic in Southern Africa with a co-infection rate of 60%. While we have benefited from innovations to fight HIV, innovations for TB have not kept pace. We must fight these two diseases together. I want to emphasize three points about CDC's work in combating TB. First, CDC leads the U.S. domestic TB program that supports states and large cities and conducts clinical and epidemiologic and laboratory public health research. Our success in domestic elimination is dependent upon our work in global TB. Secondly, a disease threat anywhere is a disease threat everywhere, and there is no greater example than this than drug-resistant TB. Thirdly, to succeed in controlling TB, we need to develop new tools, scale up existing tools in prevention, and enhance political will. Today, tuberculosis, although preventable and treatable, is the world's leading infectious disease killer, taking the lives of nearly 1.7 million people each year. Over 25% of these deaths occurred in Africa in 2016, with Southern Africa as the epicenter. One quarter of the world's population, nearly 2 billion, is infected with TB. Among those individuals who become ill with TB disease, approximately 4 million go undiagnosed and untreated. TB drug resistance first develops when patients receive incomplete or inadequate treatment. Drug resistant TB can then spread from person to person, making the disease even greater threat to global health security. Globally, in 2016, there were 600,000 new TB cases resistant to first line drugs, and 80% of them were resistant to multiple drugs. Drug resistant infections are extremely costly to treat and manage, cause intense suffering, strain fragile health systems, and result in death at much higher rates than drug susceptible TB, with only one in 10 being cured to date. 105 countries, including the United States, have also reported cases of extensively drug resistant TB, an even more severe form of the disease, which is at least 17 times more expensive to treat than medication responsive TB strains. I want to talk for a moment about the connection between CDC's global and domestic TB efforts. Over the past two decades, TB cases in the United States have decreased by 75%, and U.S. now has one of the lowest cases in the world. Yet there is still work to be done here and abroad. People born outside the U.S. make up 70% of the total TB cases in the U.S. Nearly all of these people arrived in the U.S. over 10 years ago. To control TB and prevent drug resistance in the United States, we must work outside of our borders. For example, CDC works with our counterparts, ministries of health, in more than 25 countries to combat TB, including those countries from which most U.S. TB cases originate. In South Africa, CDC has used molecular fingerprinting to determine that multidrug resistant TB cases were primarily due to person-to-person -person spread and not due to problems adhering to treatment regimens. Also, CDC is a co-lead in addressing TB, HIV co-infection in high burden countries through TEPFA. Despite recent success, stopping TB will require that we scale up access to existing tools and redouble our efforts to develop the next generation of drugs and technologies to accelerate our impact. Importantly, expanding TB preventive therapy, which is up to 90% effective in, protect in protecting people with latent TB infection from progressing to active disease, could change the trajectory of the TB epidemic. In the coming years, continued U.S. leadership will be essential to eliminating TB domestically and in the international community, mobilizes to address this threat. We have an opportunity to demonstrate our leadership at the upcoming United Nations General Assembly in September, and we need champions like the Honorable Minister Masoledi, who could not be here with us today, and each of you. In closing, I'd like to leave you with a quote from Nelson Mandela who said, it always seems impossible until it's done. At CDC, we embrace the impossible. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you so very much, uh, Dr. Burks. Thank you, Chairman Smith, Ranking Member Bass. Thank you for your continued incredible vision and support for PEPFAR. And let me again thank your staff who have been really instrumental in the work that we do every day. And to the woes behind me are so extraordinarily dedicated for TB. There's a lot of people in the audience today who are very much committed to our response globally to TB HIV. I'm not going to repeat many of the numbers that were just presented. If we can have the first graphic, I think. Um, hopefully shows you the 
absolute ramp up of both TB and HIV co-committantly in Southern Africa. And so picking this as a focus of Southern Africa was really brilliant because it shows if we control the HIV pandemic, we return to those much lower and we control the TB pa pandemic in Southern Africa. Um, our goal in PEPFAR has always been to provide the best care. And part of that best care now requires us to dramatically expand our TB activities, which we have done over the last two years. We've invested about $1.5 billion within PEPFAR on TB and TB HIV, but we're really focused on increasing and accelerating our impact. We've taken a three-prong approach. One is ensuring that all TB cases are tested for HIV, and then those cases that are found to be dually infected start on HIV treatment immediately. We're also focused, number two, on preventing TB from developing in the first place in HIV-positive clients. And this is by treating them early before their immune system begins to deteriorate. Third, we're screening our HIV-infected clients for TB and ensuring that those who have active disease are treated immediately and those who don't have active disease are immediately put on TB preventive therapy, which is a new addition to our program with a clear indicator. In our first focus area, and you know PEPFAR, we always try to be honest with ourselves. So in the first focus area of ensuring that every TB client is tested for HIV, we're at about a 95% success rate in our most recent data. And in getting those individuals on treatment, we're at a 95% success rate. This makes sense because TB clients are often seen frequently, and so it, missing that opportunity of getting them on HIV drugs would be inexcusable. In the second area, which is really preventing deterioration of the immune system, we haven't done as well. Um, and this is really, we haven't been able to prevent the new cases of TB because countries have been delayed in often starting immediate treatment. But through Sub-Saharan Africa, with the leadership of our ambassadors and countries and the leaderships of ministers of health, many countries have gone to what we call test and start. So upon immediate diagnosis of HIV, they're started on, TB started on HIV therapy, allowing them to thrive and not transmit the virus, but also preventing opportunistic infection and therefore TB. If we can see the next graphic, I wanted to be honest also with who we are missing. The blue bars are men, the green bars are women, divided by age group. These are the impact surveys that we have in the field. This is a summary of seven countries in sub-Saharan Africa, clearly showing that we're missing men between age zero and 34, and we're missing women between zero and 24. It makes sense because we implemented what we call B+, ensure all women that are pregnant and media have access to lifelong treatment about four years ago. And you can see that almost every woman over 25 has been diagnosed and is on treatment. It's really missing the healthy individuals. We know when people are infected with HIV, they have a long prodrome of asymptomatic where the immune system is constantly under destruction. If we can find them early when they're perceived to be healthy, we can prevent the consequences of these opportunistic infections. So we're very much dedicated to finding these missing healthy children, missing healthy men, and missing healthy women long before their immune system deteriorates. If we're able to do this, we've created a community of practice that not only is strengthening the health system for everyone, but also provides the platform to find other communicable, non-communicable, and future disease threats in the communities because the communities will see themselves within the health system and health-seeking behavior. Our third area of focus, the early diagnosis and treatment of TB in our HIV-positive clients, is also slowly improving. We're now up to about 76% of our clients are screened for TB when they come into our PEPFAR HIV um, clinics. And that has been a big change over the last two years. Where we are failing our clients is taking the ones that have been screened negative for active disease and getting on what we call preventive therapy. We were in the single digits and we're beginning to make progress um, quarter over quarter as we measure our progress in that indicator. We are beginning to see a real impact from our joint efforts of combating HIV and TB together. The death rates have remarkably declined and in Botswana, Namibia, and a whole series of countries where have gone to earlier treatment, there's been a dramatic decline in the number of TB cases. 
I really, if we, if immediate therapy is for anti, of antiretroviral therapy is the cornerstone of PEPFAR, both the active TB case finding and the preventive therapy will be our capstone. And so although we are behind compared to our other areas of work, we are very much focused on these areas and we appreciate your attention to this critical issue for us. Thank you. Dr. Burks, thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Cook. Thank you very much, Chairman Smith, Ranking Member Bass. Thank you very much for your leadership and support for the work the U.S. government does to advance global health and your commitment to fight tuberculosis. I'm very honored to be here today with my U.S. government colleagues to discuss our collective efforts against this deadly disease. TB has long been an important issue for me. As Chief of the Infectious Diseases Division, I helped start USAID's program 20 years ago and watched it grow to the first part of its, its existence. Thanks to the support of Congress, the U.S. government is the single largest donor to TB programs globally. Collectively, we share a vision of a world free from TB. The collaboration and complementary efforts of U.S. G departments and agencies is reflected in our implementation of U.S. government global TB strategy and the MDR National Action Plan. USAID leads USG global TB efforts through our support for high quality diagnosis, treatment, prevention, and care services for millions of people who are at risk or suffer from M TB and MDR TB. We focus in 22 high burden countries, including five in Southern Africa. We also support an additional 32 countries through targeted technical assistance, primarily in support of global TB, uh, uh, global fund TB grants. Our efforts are designed to accelerate and optimize implementation of country-owned and led national TB programs. In order to achieve the greatest impact on the TB epidemic, we focus on the areas with the greatest burden of disease and on ensuring that the innovations with the highest potential are rapidly identified and widely implemented. We focus in countries with the highest burden of TB, of drug-resistant TB, and HIV-associated TB. We use data to target our interventions to benefit the majority of those suffering from TB. TB predominantly affects the poorest and most vulnerable with approximately 95% of TB deaths occurring in low and middle income countries. Each day, more than 4,600 individuals die from this curable disease. The majority of the TB burden is in Asia. Almost 60% of all TB cases are found in India, Indonesia, China, Pakistan, and the Philippines. The while HIV-associated TB only accounts for one-tenth of the world's TB cases, it has a disproportionate impact in Africa, which is home to 75% of the global TB HIV cases. The investments on TB have paid off. Since 2000, our support in USAID priority countries contributed to a 40% decrease in TB-related mortality and a 27% decrease in TB prevalence. In the last two years, USAID has helped provide high quality TB treatment for 6 million TB patients, including 150,000 MDR TB patients. USAID investments over the past 20 years have dramatically improved global and national TB surveillance systems, which have enabled better targeting of interventions at the global and country level improved and improved data for decision making. At the country level, USAID works with national TB programs and local partners to scale up and accelerate implementation of new tools and approaches, focusing on four pillars. The first is person-centered care. TB care has evolved to embrace a human rights approach that is focused on meeting the indiv individual needs of each person so they are able to access timely, quality diagnosis, care, and treatment regardless of where they seek services. Typically, this is through primary health care in community settings. USAID increasingly works with faith-based and community organizations to provide the support needed, improve treatment outcomes, and combat the stigma so often borne by TB patients, particularly among women and children. Secondly, access to early diagnosis and initiation of quality treatment is one of the best ways to prevent the transmission of active TB, TB disease, as well as the development of MDR-TB. We leverage American innovation and in industry to scale up new tools for better diagnosis and treatment. With Johnson & Johnson, for example, we've introduced Bevacolin, a new TB option for people with drug resistance, in more than 70 countries for 25,000 people, often providing the only treatment option. USAID is also partnering with the diagnostic companies such as Cepheid and Becton Dickinson to expand access to rapid TB and drug-resistant testing. The third pillar is preventing the development of active TB disease. USAID works to prevent both the transmission of TB from one person to another and the progression from latent TB infection to active TB disease. 
The combination of TB pre preventive therapy and antiretroviral therapy reduced the risk of developing active TB disease in people living with a HIV by up to 90%. As Amba Ambassador Burks has already noted, scaling up TB preventive therapy among people with HIV is critical and requires a strengthened and more focused approach. Fourth is accelerating research and innovation. USAID's research portfolio has been a key component of our TB pr program since its inception. In close cooperation with USG partners, USAID has supported several late-stage research studies that have led to major policy changes, including a standardized fixed-dose combination TB regimen and a shortened MDR-TB treatment regimen. The UN high-level meeting on TB later this year will provide a much-needed opportunity to bring global attention to a disease that, despite its horrific impact, is all too often ignored or unseen. It is critical that we continue to maximize investments and leverage additional resources to bring self-reliant, sustainable TB responses within countries. We stand at a pivotal juncture, but with your sed steadfast support, we can make the help the world take the right path. With increased political commitment, we can and will end TB. Thank you again for your support. I look thank you, uh, Ms. Cook. Thank you very much. Thank you all uh, for your testimonies, and again, most importantly, for your uh, extraordinary leadership. Let me just ask you, you know, one of the reasons why drug resistance in all diseases, including TB, has decreased across many diseases, infectious diseases, is the misuse of antibiotics, um, not completing the regimen as prescribed. Um, how are the physicians and dispensers, the, the health care professionals, um, has the education of those individuals and especially those who are affected then um, been as robust as it could be to mitigate that problem? Thank you for the question. I'll start off and happy to hand over, but definitely with the work that we have been doing in training healthcare okay. providers, um, also working through the Clinical Trials Consortium, which is engages other countries as well, the opportunity to create centers of excellence for training is very critical. Uh, CDC's efforts in, as well in combating antimicrobial resistance has taken on these efforts of in ensuring that we are working towards the efforts of addressing, as you've mentioned, both the leadership and the use of antimicrobial um, re resistant and agents, but also the importance of making sure that people complete treatment. Uh, and this is something within TB that we have been working on to ensure looking at how to improve regimens for treatment so that they can be shorter courses and also less harmful side effects so that people will finish and less drug resistance will form. If I could just add to what Dr. Martin has talked about, the other, one of the areas that's been a real focus for our programs is, is reaching all clinicians and throughout the system. I mean, very often what we see in a number of countries is, is people will go to their regular doctor, their private provider, for example, who may or may not be trained on tuberculosis or recognize it right away. So they may just pre prescribe some antibiotics or a piece of it. So it's been really important and real focus to try to reach all providers, whether they be in the public sector or the private sector, and try to make sure that particularly private sector providers, and we see this often in a, in a number of countries, may not at the outset provide the right treatment, but to make sure they really understand what the appropriate treatment <coughs> regimen is and do the diagnosis before they begin treatment. And that's a, been a really important area of support for us and something we really need to continue to get the word out and make sure all providers are part of the network and are connected to the, the public system so you can get the reporting up through there. To your system. You know, the high-level meeting that's slated for September 26th at the United Nations, which could be a, a true pivot point mm -hmm. for all of our governments, including our own, to do even more because we'll have a a more cohesive plan. Could you perhaps fill us in on where we are in terms of, obviously they will show up, the delegates on the September 26th with a plan largely intact. Uh, how long, well along are you in those preparations? What does it look like? Yeah, I don't think this is the Manhattan Project where <laughs> we've got secrets that can't be uh, 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 conveyed. Uh, could you give us a, a good insight as to where we are right now? Maybe let me start and ask my colleagues to add on. So there's been lots of uh, much, much discussion around what, what really do we no need to get out of the high-level meeting. And, and this actually this meeting is the culmination of years and years of effort to really get it on the, on the agenda. And we really owe a big thanks to, to Minister Mozzoletti, who's been a, a tremendous champion to make this happen. So at the, what we are really hoping is will come out of this is, is a very high-level goal of getting targeting 40 million people on treatment by 22. So 40 by 22 is the, is the, the very high-level ask. 
But part of that, and this is one of the things that is being pushed through the development of the, the communique, is about making sure there's an, a, a accountability framework. So in order to reach that goal, what every country really needs to do, and using the kind of data that, that we've been talking about, that there is an accountability for every country about what they need to do to reach those patients who are not yet diagnosed and put on treatment and supported throughout treatment. We're also really pushing for an independent body to monitor that, much like has been done for polio and done so successfully, to really make sure that there is that not only is there accountability, but there's a, a oversight of that accountability. And then also working with faith-based and civil society groups, making sure they're part and parcel of the, the commitment and the instruction, and also private sector as well. Has the outreach to faith-based been as robust as it should be? I think it's underway, and this is where the Stop TB Partnership has been playing a really Great. important role of reaching civil society and trying to reach the, the outreach. I think that we can do a lot more, and that would be a really high priority over the coming months to make sure, to make sure the faith-based community is absolutely there. Because I, I raised that, you know, in my early career in the 1980s, early in the 80s, uh, I authored the Child Survival Amendment, which put $50 million into immunizations, and went to Central America several times, including to El Salvador, when they had days of tranquility, and the FMLN and the Duarte government ceased all fighting so kids could be immunized against polio, diphtheria, pertussis, and the like. And it was the church that made that happen. They admonished mothers, families, to bring their children for the immunization. They, at many of the vaccination sites, they were church sites. Uh, so, and I know USAID and Mark Green get it. I know all you, you get it, how important it is to have a partner that has such a low cost overhead can get volunteers, we've done it with HIV AIDS for years, PEPFAR, uh, but I just hope on this mobilization there's a full inclusion of faith-based entities. Uh. Yes, no, I couldn't agree with you more, sir. The, the faith-based community is a tremendously important voice on this, and as you described, they've been so involved, uh, members of that community have been so involved in health issues, but certainly TB as well, and I think can be an extraordinarily <coughs> powerful force at the, at the UN high-level mission, and it's part of what our engagement and as you noted, um, uh, Administrator Green is very, very committed to this, and uh, we have regular conversations with our clients about how can we actually Thank make you. sure that TB is on their agenda as well. Let me ask you, uh, you know, first of all, I want to thank Dr. Burks for introducing or holding that meeting that we had in New York with uh, uh, Dr. Aaron Mosaledi, uh, that he, we had hoped that he would be here, and he, he had to cancel due to other pressing issues, but um, that meeting was, was extraordinary, so I want to thank Dr. Burks for, for putting that meeting together. Let me ask you, uh, obviously for many of our pharmaceutical companies developing drugs um, to combat or to hopefully cure TB uh, is a high bar because the rate of return is just not there for them. And I'm wondering if there are incentives, uh, any recommendations you can make to try to get even further buy-in uh, on the R&D side with our pharmaceuticals who do amazing work. Uh, like on, on neglected tropical diseases, I mean, they have been leaders and have provided an enormous amount of, of, of research with very little or no return because it's the right thing to do. And I'm wondering uh, on the TB issue if you could speak to that. I just open on, on this one because I think one of the, the important part we have from the program side is as new drugs, and we, we saw the new <coughs> CDC recommendation in the MMWR for a, a one-month short course on treatment. Our job is that as we have these new drugs and new regimens available is to get them into program because nothing is more encouraging from the pharmaceutical industry to take their hard-earned research <coughs> and clinical trials and translate that into client care. And I think that's part, of the, that's part of our job to really ensure not only that there's incentives, but that the drugs get utilized quickly when they're shown to be effective. It, this new preventive therapy going to one month will be, is a huge breakthrough for clients. That's, that's a game changer when they know they only have to take a medicine for 30 days. I mean, we do have, if we were to remind people, curative drugs available today for each of these different entities. We would love that in HIV if we had <laughs> curative drugs. So I think for us not to do everything to utilize them effectively is really a tragedy. So I think we want to be really committed to translating new drugs into action immediately. Just to add to that, I think the, you know, we, 
in the last couple of years, there finally has been a new drug that has come out for TD. This is bedaquilin and some other, but for the first time in, in over 40 years. And so the, the investments in research that have happened over the last 10 or 15 years are finally paying off after long, long neglect. And there are a few more, I think, in the research pipeline. But we've been really fortunate for bedaquilin. The, the Johnson & Johnson, which has been behind this, is really committed to making sure that it's available. There we have a, a memorandum of understanding with J&J &J to do donation of bedaquilin as it goes through the final stages of research. It's already been approved actually by WHO, even ahead of being approved by the, by the FDA, which is, which is quite, a, quite a groundbreaking effort, if you will. So as we go through the donation program and, and they move to market in the final stages, it will be available and it really has made a huge difference on the treatment of MDOPD. But there are more drugs needed in the pipeline and, and we will obviously continue to continue the research pipeline. I know that NIH and the Executive PD Alliance for Drug Development are after and they're a hugely important part of what we do in TD as well. Um, yes. I just add to this, I think as well, that the work that is being done, especially um, in finding the missing cases, so the active case finding, also makes and closes the gap by 40% of those who don't complete treatment. And being able, this will also make the market more viable once you see the ability to be able to use the drugs and can close the gap uh, for ensuring people are treated. Ranking Member Bass. Great. Um, thank the th I want to thank the three of you again for, um, for testifying today, but way more important than that for your dedication and your work. Uh, unfortunately, I'm gonna I'm doing double duty in two hearings, and we'll have to run out. But I did want to ask just a few quick questions. Um, you know, you mentioned uh, Dr. Burks about um, diagnosing and treating people right away, and I was just curious: how is TB diagnosed uh, in Africa? I mean, I certainly know how I worked in the medical field for many years. We do a skin test or an X-ray, but that also takes time to get the results back. So you can't just see a patient and then give treatment. So how is it diagnosed? So we're very fortunate in collaborating both with the TB program and the HIV program to rapidly get gene experts in the field mm. so that we can rapidly diagnose. Now this gene expert machine is molecular in basis and can be used for HPV. It can be used for new zoonotic events. So it, it is a technology that's now available throughout Sub-Saharan Africa. We spent the last year mapping where every single gene expert machine is. And interestingly, we found that we have more gene expert machines than we need. So the good news is the equipment is not the limiting factor. Oh. It's utilizing it effect effectively. So we have, uh, uh, if we want to test every TB client, we have enough gene expert machines available in the country. And I think that's really reassuring to everybody until we map them. You know, everybody wasn't communicating, but we've had this great collaboration between the TB program and the HIV program because we were each buying them. Mm -hmm. And now when we put them together, we see that there's a capacity there to test everyone and provide that rapid diagnosis and get people on treatment immediately. And uh, as you said, that is the key right. to the health and welfare of our clients in the long run and also the key to creating non-transmissibility at the household level and to the health care providers, which we have to remember, and thank you for bringing that up. It's really not import only important that we train the health care provider on how to diagnose TB, but also how they can protect themselves with infection control. You were also mentioning um, a percentage of patients that are diagnosed diagnosed with TB and you um, test them immediately for HIV, what's the percent? 95. Yeah. We're up to 95 percent of the TB cases are tested for HIV and gotten no, on what's HIV. What's the percent of HIV that are HIV positive? It changes by country in South Africa. Some places it's, it's so that graphic where I showed uh -huh. you where we're missing men, it's higher the more people you're missing early in the early stages. So as we find ways to find men and well children early, the TB cases should plummet. So a TB case and that percentage, having a high percentage of HIV in the TB is a, is a reference point for us not doing as well as we should because I that see. shouldn't happen. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we want that to be zero, but right <coughs> now it's everywhere from 5% to probably 60%. Wow. Um, but that's our failure on the HIV side to not getting people on HIV treatment early so that there's no dual infection. And you mentioned, uh, thank you, thank you. And Dr. Martin, you were mentioning uh, other countries. You said that there are several countries where, t where people come into the United States and TB is uh, spread. I'm used to seeing in Los Angeles, a lot of our TB cases were in the homeless population. 
uh, it didn't impact, it wasn't from people coming in the country, but what are those countries that you were referring to? Thank you, and, and, and just to note too, while they may not be US born, it's not that it's their first arriving with TB, it's, it's more that we're seeing that after a year or 50% after 10 years may move on to active TB disease. I see. And those countries that we're seeing them are India, Vietnam, China, Philippines. Um, am I missing one? Oh, the countries Mexico. that Dr. Cook was mentioning. I and see. It's, and it's we're seeing, as, as, men, as um, Elaine Koch mentioned, it's with the middle-income countries where we're seeing these as well. It's not just low-income countries, but middle-income countries that need to be able to stop and detect diseases where they're occurring, the TB, and stop it before it comes and be able to spread or create drug resistance. Thank you. I see. Dr. Cook, did you want to respond to that as well? Yeah, just to add on to that, in, um, because I, I think the, the burden is indeed in a number of those countries, and in addition to a very high burden in southern Africa, particularly where the co-infection issue is, as, as Dr. Burks talked about, but there is a, a big burden in other countries in Africa, which is less driven by HIV, and then as we, we talked about earlier, also in, in Asia, where you do have the, the largest number, the countries with the largest numbers, and they are these lower middle income countries. Um, and so our work in those countries is really catalytic because the resources to pay for the TB programs or pay for the health systems is really coming for the countries. But our work is catalytic to make sure that to get the right treatment, make sure the right treatment diagnosis is happening. Mr. Garrett. So obviously a uh, little late getting to the table here. But on the subject matter of tuberculosis, I pulled up the Comonix site. I want to thank you all and your staff. I believe that uh, Dr. Burks, you were present on the Comonix hearing, and we got a wonderfully detailed um, series of responses from you all, which I would like to pretend happens all the time that we ask for them, um, but it, it doesn't, and I'm grateful for that. And, and uh, as soon as I got in, I sat down and looked up Comonix to see if they were doing TB work in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, which they're not. Um, so that uh, abates a, a potential line of questioning. But, um, you know, I guess what I'm most interested in is a cost-benefit analysis as it relates to um, fostering desirable outcomes for global stability, um, minimum basic global human opportunity as within the scope of this committee and, and how addressing something that was largely eradicated, largely, in the United States three generations ago, my father's mother had tuberculosis. She contracted as a nurse during the Great Depression. Um, what, what, what the cost-benefit analysis is for us getting involved in this realm now, what, what's the good that we're, and, I, and, I, and this is in no way, shape, or form a skeptical question, but just an opportunity to tell the story that, that we're able to do and at what cost, and are we having success? And again, I apologize for my tardiness. Um, um, bang for the buck lies. Again, PEPFAR is a success story as it relates to HIV in Africa, et cetera. We talked about that in a previous hearing. What are we doing in this, this realm that we, that we need to know about, that we need to trumpet? When I go tell my constituents why foreign aid dollars matter, why U.S. Uh, global health involvement matters. I just want to thank you for your line of questioning during the Chemonix group for really talking about efficiencies and effectiveness in programming because that is a very critical component to, to our work at all times. And I think the work that we described within the tuberculosis field is we've done the analysis, not only cost savings to the United States, but cost savings to the health programs in every one of these countries so that they can invest dollars in their new and burgeoning issues that are going to come up. We know that there's this youth bulge. And so if we have co-infection of TB or HIV, we, we had a slide up before you came in about the undiagnosed HIV cases are all in healthy people now, and those healthy people are all under 35. And 60% of Sub-Saharan Africa will be under 20 by 2020. So we see that confluence of those two pieces that by preventing the next cycle of either HIV or TB, the cost sa savings not only to, to us, but to the health system in general for Sub-Saharan Africa so that they can invest more and more dollars into their new and burgeoning, we hope, um, growing um, age expectancy into the 60s and the NCDs. Could I add to that question? Thank you very much, Congressman. I wanted to just add for our analysis we've done for every $1 invested, there's $43 return on the investment for investing in <coughs> reduction of mortality for TB. In addition, we do see 
uh, multi-drug resistant and TB as one of the largest global health security threats and national security to countries, both economically and in terms of trade. So just wanted to mention that. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I could just add one I, more I, piece I on knew this, you were ready. I beat this horse to death, but just one more piece. The other thing about TD as a part of the global efforts and the global assistance that, that the U.S. does provide is mo our, our resources are relatively small to what countries are putting into their own TD programs. So our, our pieces of money that are really catalytic, and it really is that 80 percent of the costs are borne by countries. And you're, and you're li li literally getting buy-in. And again, I'm a fiscal hawk but who, who, who leans towards shrinking government, but I'm a big advocate for foreign aid where it's done properly. And, and, and so what I want to see, and I think we are seeing here, and PEPFAR, again, is the, is, the, is the great example, is the goodwill that we can export by virtue of, for lack of a better expression, given a darn, um, that manifests itself, and there are a lot of things that need to happen. That 60% that of sub-Saharan Africa under the age of 20 by 2020 is scary in and of itself. Having said that, with, with increased education, for example, you see decreased birth rates, right? Now, the United States can't, with $21 trillion in debt, shoulder this entire burden, but somebody's got to lead. The Chinese foreign aid model is give money to the oligarchs and, and the dictators, and ours is to help people, but we need to brand it. So, we're, so it's clear, I'm asking, there's a question mark coming, that these are the efforts of uh, the United States, that, that this, this, is, this leadership, that this seed money, this 20% that begets the 80%, is essentially got a red, white, and blue USA, not literally, label on it. Yes, it is, and there's a lot of recognition for the work we do at country level through the TB, TB programs, in addition, that's complementary to the work through PEPFAR, because it, it really is recognized that, that this is coming from the, the, the American people and the, the engagement from the U.S. government. I would commend that to continue, and, and you guys are not the enemy. We're on the same team here. Yeah. Uh, that's so important. I, I think you stem radicalization, and there's a, certainly a, there's a lot of messaging, some of it within this country. Uh, we kinda, have we gone all this time without talking about Russian meddling? Um, trying to identify us as something that I hope we're not. Um, we need to be clear on what we are, and this is a good way to do it. And again, when I get with my fiscal sort of um, um, budget hawk crowd, I need to be to say, here's why this matters that we're quantifying lives saved, not just in Sub-Saharan Africa, but around the world by virtue of creating outcomes wherein there's hope, right? I would argue, and Chris has probably heard me do this a hundred times, that, uh, that a young person who wants to go to med school one day usually doesn't strap on a bomb vest. But when there's no hope, the 14-year-old will pick up the AK-47 for a meal. So thank you, and please continue to make sure that folks, know, not that we are, uh, you know, hegemonic and all-knowing, because arrogance precedes resentment, right? But that we'd give a darn. So thank you. I'd like to add on that, too. I think the other value is the lessons that we've learned here in the U.S. being one of the lowest cases of the countries in the, in the world, the lessons we've learned in how to deal with latent TB infection and how we've been able to test and how to be able to identify. These are practices and opportunities we can share with other countries as well, our experiences that can then be tailored, and this is something as well that gives us an opportunity to share those information. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for what you do. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Dr. Morton, uh, you had said in, in an article that you published on World Tuberculosis Day that every dollar spent on TB results in a $43 economic benefit to society. And of course, if you're disease or parasite free, there's no cost. I mean, that, that, that's incalculable and, and we all want to be healthy. But in the actual dollars and cents world, uh, we often have to make an argument as to why spending that next dollar or dollars is justifiable. And that kind of analysis is helpful uh, in, in prying loose those additional dollars. So if you could speak to that calculation, if you would. Secondly, let me ask, um, um, if I could, you know, more than half of the funds, roughly $16 billion for the global plan uh, to eliminate TB by 2035 are anticipated to be raised by affected countries. And I'm wondering if you could speak uh, to, uh, you know, are we talking about greater burden sharing, those countries picking up more of a piece? Um, if they don't, obviously there has to be a, 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 a safety net so that sick people are, uh, don't continue to be sick. Uh, and uh, it, so if you could speak to that, what countries are doing the best? Uh, and we know some of the countries are doing the worst. Um, uh, you know, we look at North Korea, where the president just visited, or just recently. Uh, I remember being in South Korea many years ago, meeting with a priest who actually had access 
to Pyongyang uh, to treat and help uh, tuberculosis patients, including drug resistant, those who are suffering from drug resistance. Um, our government was supportive, uh, not too overtly, because, but it, it was like an open secret that they're there just to help the people. And I'm wondering, you know, a country like North Korea where the healthcare grid is, is abysmal, uh, it doesn't get much worse, and the prioritization give by, given by Kim is probably non-existent. But, you know, as this drug resistance breaks out, obviously there are pockets. Speak to the worst countries of, of the world, if you would, as well as this idea of um, um, the burden sharing uh, to meet the goals by 2035. Let me also ask you, if I could, um, uh, what would you like to see included in new TB legislation? Where are the gaps, the unmet, you know, what we haven't met before? Um, you know, you do so much and do it so extraordinarily well uh, by administrative action when there are gaps, but there probably are some authorities and statutory uh, changes that you would find to be helpful. Um, what needs to be updated um, in the National Action Plan for Combating MDRTB of 2015? Again, that would be a similar issue of, of uh, what we and what you're doing, but we need to catch up on uh, if you would. And again, I did ask before, maybe you could elaborate a little further if you would, uh, for the upcoming UN meeting. Um, what does it look like? What will the plan, in your view, if you can share that with us, uh, look like? Or is it still in a, in a stage where it's not ready for uh, publication? Aaron. Sure. Maybe, maybe you answer both. OK, <laughs> I'll start with the first question. Um, on that, as we've said, in terms of doing the analysis of looking at for every one dollar that's invested in reducing mortality uh, due to TB, we do find a $43 savings. Now this, in looking at return on investments for other infectious diseases, this is very comparable, but actually one of the higher ones to in terms of being able to invest. And I think as uh, Iran Koch has mentioned, we do see that countries are sh uh, shouldering the bur most of the burden and the cost of this, of 80% of the cost for TB are paid for by the countries that have the disease burden as well, and that this will continue. To your point then about what's going to be needed in, in looking at to shoulder this uh, going forward and what are we expecting countries to do, I think one of the biggest things that's important and it leads into the UN General Assembly is the political will. Creating that political will and having that those champions to be able to make sure that this is taken on as a serious issue and brought forward. Uh, we've seen this in some countries and you asked for some good examples uh, looking at India where one country where we work uh, we've been working at looking at how to improve air control and air quality in some of the facilities. Uh, the model that was seen uh, did lead to good success for infection prevention and control, and the states, it has now been expanded to an additional seven states in India, but the government is picking this up and doing it themselves. So as we see good practices and the government's being able to take them on and to scale them up, um, our funds are seen, our activities are catalytic in moving forward a lot of these efforts. Uh, in thinking about what are some of the, what post unga looks like and thinking about this, I think Irene Koch has mentioned very well uh, the need for an accountability framework. And this is to look at progress being made globally, but also the resources that are being tracked and being followed. Um, the mention of an independent monitoring board such as exists for polio eradication is one example of moving this effort forward, uh, but it would have to make sure that there is some accountability, and I think U.S. leadership in this is critical and appreciate you keeping this on the agenda to move these efforts forward, and thank you for your work in that. The other big piece, I think, as we've mentioned, is engaging the civil society, the faith-based organizations, um, and really looking at, well, how U.S. commitment can be leveraged by other countries to get them more engaged as well as to step up and ensure that we continue our resources globally for the efforts that are needed. So I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Just building on some of your uh, um, questions, the, on the $16 billion, I don't have the global plan in front of me, and we'd be happy to share that, but exactly as Dr. Martin said, 80% of it does come from countries. Now, a significant share from a Ministry of Health budget, if you will, but there's also a concern that a fair bit of that also comes from out-of-pocket expenditures. And since TB really does affect the poorest of the poor, we want to make sure that they're not being driven into, into complete poverty by, by TB. So looking at those details at a country level is really, really important, but be happy to share 
of what we have on that particular board. Oh, so, uh, it, yeah, if you don't mind, I, you've really given me a great segue. Um, so we know that TB affects the poorest of the poor, and we know that we try to um, tie our aid to the economic achievement in a country because it's more reasonable to demand that, say, South Africa uh, chip in than, than maybe one of their neighbors to the north who might not have the opportunity towards economic prosperity that, that say, the mining industry is perpetually sort of brought to South Africa. But all fruit aren't apples, and so in South Africa, for example, in the Rand Belt up around Pretoria, you've got sort of a transient population based on economic opportunity that exists within the mining employment community, and therefore a heightened risk of transmission and then traveling outward. How do you make sure we're not doing a one-size-fits-all and saying, well, South Africa has achieved this level of economic achievement, therefore they need to carry this burden, when perhaps we might be more effective in addressing the spread if we target sort of the hotbeds of transmission, right, which exi exists there. And then secondarily and tangentially, um, I've been, the health minister in South Africa has kind of taken a role here, if you can sort of tie that in in your response. I was going to say Aaron's last name, but then I would say it wrong. And <laughs> we learned it by reading, not by Thank you, because that actually leads into an answer to, to one of uh, Chairman Smith's other, other questions, because Teamwork. South, Af South Africa is a, um, a really good example, both of a success story, and given the, the strong leadership we've seen from, from Minister Mozzoletti and the government, and even, even the current, yes, right, I've had practice, sir, <laughs> all right, <laughs> on, on that. And they've worked, the government and the Ministry of Health has worked really closely with the mine and the mining industry to make sure that because it is mine, are a hotbed of, of TB, right? And and miners do go back to their homes where which might be more poor. So making sure their the miners are tested and started on treatment and the treatment is followed as they go home so they're not taking TB back to their communities. So they have a very, very strong program on that partnership with the mining industry. Our work in in South Africa is, you know, minuscule compared to in terms of dollar amount. You know, it's you know builds on the work that, that Ambassador Burke is doing through PEPFAR around TB. But it really is that kind of partnership that Ambassador Burke talks about before. That it is meant to catalyze what the ministry, what the government of South Africa is doing. And exactly as you say, there would be, you know, our, that work in South Africa is much more catalytic and much smaller relative to what we might need to do in a, a much more poor country. We're trying to work also with the global fund grants in those countries to make sure they're and, really and, and one of the problems of government inherently, in, in my experience, and, and I think you guys do a bang-up job here, but uh, is that we do create a one-size-fits-all paradigm wherein sometimes we, we let things fall out. So that's to be commended. You've identified really the problem. and Because, yeah, I mean, on, on an on a economic achievement scale, by virtue of natural resources that are really in certain areas unparalleled, but – and. So yeah, Just on avoiding the this is the way we do it, so this is the way we should do it thing, which I think you're doing. On that point, because it's really an important one, and, and one size fits all really doesn't work for, for something like TB as it does for anything else. So we work really closely with our counterparts at, at, at country for, they all have a strategy for how to deal with TB. Where are the, where is the, where's the burden the greatest? Where are the patients most? Where do we need to do the, the most work? So working within that just get country you guys level strategy is what, what happens. And it really does vary from one country to another. We just need to get you guys to work on K-12 ed here in the States. Yeah, I just, just quickly, because I think it ties some of your pieces together and you talk about what things should look like. I mean, what we've learned in PEPFAR is this political will and transcending that political will into really focusing domestic and global resources where the need is the greatest. And I think you point out a really critical issue. Oftentimes in opposition areas, in informal settlements, there is not that same attention to the most vulnerable who are at higher risk for HIV and TB. And, and we need to link our catalytic funds to these kind of policy changes and investments that are linked to where the need is the greatest. And I think holding countries accountable to investing this accountability framework needs to be linking where diseases are and where investments are, because we often see that those aren't always in complete alignment. And I think that's really important. And I think when you talked about education of the healthcare workers and that importance, the piece of this within the FBOs that I think we haven't paid enough attention to in the last decade is the alignment with the churches and engagement with the churches. We have to get education back into the churches around these core diseases 
they can be critical in identifying the most vulnerable in the community that aren't getting adequate access to either health care or the resources that they need. And I think yeah, the FBOs have been tremendous, but we need to engage directly the pastors and the churches in a real way. Before I yield to Mr. Castro, on that point, on one trip to Nigeria that I made during the previous administration, we had about a $500 million health care budget. So I asked how much of that in Nigeria, like much of Africa, if not all of sub-Saharan Africa, is very, very faith-based. I asked how much of that is being allocated towards faith-based entities. Uh, I had just left uh, um, uh, the uh, Jos, where churches have been firebombed, and Archbishop Kagama had a had a HIV/AIDS um, um, uh, or a PEPFAR program pulled from him, which he was was absolutely inexplicable uh, for um, orphans, hundred orphans, and all of a sudden there was no more money. I never got an answer ever, uh, but I asked how much of, of that money, the five hundred million, has been broken out for uh, this faith-based Nigeria, and it was about 7%, 8%. Um, just uh, that has to change and is changing like, you know, like I know. I'd like to yield to Mr. Castro. Thanks. Uh, thank you for your testimony, and thank you for being here and for all the work that you're doing in Africa and I'm sure in different parts of the world. I'm told by my grandmother, I was told back then, that her mother died of tuberculosis in Mexico in around 1922, early 1920s. And I noticed that there has been about a 26% cut in the president's budget request in 2018 from 2017. Uh, so let me ask you, what would be the impact, the human impact, of the work that you do? And uh, how many more people wouldn't get served if that, in fact, uh, ends up being the cut that we sustain? Well, thank you. Sir, and I really do want to appreciate and thank the, the strong support we've received from Congress for, for the TB program. I think you're aware the, the budget request did reflect an overall constrained budget, um, uh, constrained budget environment. However, the, the resources that were in that even reduced request would be targeted to the highest priority countries for, for us where the, the biggest burden is. So I can't quite do the calculation on how many people would not do services, but given that our work really is catalytic meant to be for at country level, we would really try to prioritize among the, those high burden countries and try to, to really make sure that the resources went as far as they could. Uh, but you agree that less people will get served? I would imagine so. It would be have to be a calculation. We'd have to do that. Sure. Yeah, I guess I can submit for the record a, a, an analysis. I mean, there's 400,000 people each year in Africa that die from tuberculosis. Uh, so I, I'll submit a question for the record on the human impact of the 26% cut uh, if it, in, in fact, goes through. Um, let me ask you, we have uh, the chairman sent out a memo that has the rankings of the top 10 causes of death worldwide. And, um, but do you know, with respect to Africa, where TB ranks, this is a worldwide ranking, but do you know where it ranks in, in terms of Africa? Right now, it's the primary infectious disease cause of death um, because of the high HIV driving component to that. So um, we believe as we control the HIV pandemic, we will control the, H the TB <laughs> pandemic in sub-Saharan Africa in most of the countries where it's being dual driven. Yeah, I was just going to add as well, I think what the other piece that we see is that the increased um, drug resistance occurring as well. Um, and also the importance of, as we see it being one of the leading causes, that as well as if people are not treated and if people don't finish treatment, the opportunity for drug resistance to grow and to increase and the impact of that as well uh, increases in terms of being able to treat them and the cost to treat them as well. All right, thank you, I yield back. Thank you. Let me just ask one final question. You know, there is an enhanced uh, vulnerability of women who are pregnant uh, to TB. And, you know, from my point of view, I believe that there are two patients when a woman is pregnant, both the unborn child and the mother, and everything humanly possible should be done to enhance their health. That's why I, this committee and I and, and my staff are so absolutely committed to the first thousand days from conception to the second birthday, so those, the children and the women, the mothers, are as healthy as humanly possible. And I'm wondering, uh, you know, is there any special uh, protocol necessary 
to ensure that uh, the woman's health is, 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 is protected and strengthened uh, if she were to get um, TB while she is pregnant. And of course, um, what are the vulnerabilities to the baby in terms of um, transfer of the disease? I will start. Um, I'm glad you picked up on that because we've also noticed that within HIV. There's a unique high rate of um, susceptibility. It was just published um, in an abstract at CROI just a few months ago of women and in their last tri semester and in those first six months after delivery. And we're trying to really understand that. And so this increased intensity of oversight and screening both for TB and HIV will be absolutely critical because obviously it's much more important to the pregnant woman to prevent the disease from ever occurring because the drugs, um, as all drugs, have toxicity across the board and certainly MDR drugs have particular toxicity. So it's, it's more about making sure that women remain healthy by ensuring they come into the pregnancy healthy and their immune system is intact so that you can prevent the occurrence of reactivation of TB. Thank you. Okay. Um, anything further any of you would like to say? Again, your recommendations on legislation um, would be very well uh, appreciated. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Martin. Thank you. I just wanted to respond to Congressman Garrett's question too about not one size fits all. And how do you identify those areas? And I think this is the importance of surveillance and the importance of, of being able to hone in and know what's happening, having those data to be able to use in real time to know where those hot spots are, to know what we can then do to focus as opposed to blanketing everywhere. How can you really hone in? And that requires that we have and that countries have those data available and the importance of surveillance to be able to detect and the laboratory work to be able to know the confirmation. Thank you. I just, uh, oh yes, Dr. Cook. I would just uh, say one thing on legislation. I think the most important thing from legislation would be it's the signal it sends of the importance of something like TB. And just as this hearing has been a really important signal about why this is such a, an issue that re requires the attention. So we very much appreciate your time on well, that. Thank you. And your testimonies and the information as well as the questions and those that we will submit, we do share with the appropriators who are, you know, always looking for insights and, and you know, so uh, we will expand this to other members of Congress so that they know just how important this is. But again, thank you for your leadership. I would just conclude by saying that uh, sustainable political will coupled with compassion and competent leadership uh, has is the reason, I believe, why the HIV AIDS pandemic, which Henry Hyde, the author of that legislation, it was George Bush and Henry Hyde and all of us behind them, but they were the leaders. Uh, I remember Henry Hyde telling all of us um, in a Republican caucus, and he did it frequently from the chair, that this is the equivalent of the bubonic plague, that unless very, very aggressive uh, uh, actions are taken, uh, this will get, it's already awful, it will get far worse. Uh, and he was a driver like no other, as Bush was right there, of course, leading. And it, it shows that where there's a political will, where that compassion exists, and you have competent leadership like you, it makes all the difference in the world. So thank you. Uh, you have friends here on the Hill. Uh, it's bipartisan, and we'll do everything we can to support you uh, following your lead. The hearing's adjourned.